Levine from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of mystery with Vincent Price as your host. This is Vincent Price. Back in the good old days, committing a murder was such fun. One automatically joined, so to speak, a small and very exclusive club in which all the members, standing above the common herd in a sort of secret splendor, never even guessed who the other members might be. Of course, one had to get away with it. And that was where the excitement lay. Because in those days, my friends, there was the awful specter of the hangman to contend with, with his hempen noose and his wooden trapdoor. Why, the very thought is enough to curdle a gentleman's blood. There was the choice of method to mull over. A gun, a knife, a length of cord, perhaps, or poison. And there was the really quite arduous selection of a suitable victim, because just any passerby plainly wouldn't do at all. Also, of course, it all had to be neat and tidy and quiet and unobtrusive. And it had to remain forever a ghastly secret. Oh, George, please don't slam the door like that. I have a cake in the oven. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. I... You make it sound as though there might be some connection between a cake in the oven and the kitchen door. I've told you before a dozen times. If you slam the door, the cake will go flat. You've quite possibly ruined it for me. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I really am sorry, darling. I... You really should know that by now. I can't for the life of me think why you never pay the slightest attention to what I tell you. Yes, darling. George Havery, Bella Havery. Married for 22 years, only the first of which was a happy one. And George, oh, the dear man, has decided to join that very exclusive club we spoke of. The crucial problem is finding a suitable victim. <laughs> I have a feeling that George Havery has already found her very close at hand. And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Our story, Mushrooms, Darling, by Alan Caillou. Our star, Ben Wright. First love is rather like a kind of vaccination. It saves a man from catching the disease a second time. And one might hope, surely, that George Havery, having fallen in and out of love with Bella Havery, would be very wary indeed about treading that delightfully dangerous path again. Not so. There happens to be a very lovely young woman in our story, really quite delectable. Her name is Susan. And poor George fell head over heels in love with her the first time they met, quite a while ago now. But then, George is the kind of man who'll fall into anything. But I, I'm getting ahead of myself. First of all, let's find out just how it goes between George and Bella these days. Oh, darling, don't trample mud all over my nice, clean kitchen, please. How often do I have to tell you that? Uh, darling, I am wiping my feet. Oh, for heaven's sake, shut the door. It's freezing this evening. Well, it's not really freezing, darling. It's just brisk and invigorating. And the wood pile is getting terribly low. If you'd spend more time cutting up logs instead of pottering around in the forest all day. Oh, the, fo the, well, the forest is full of the most marvelous things this time of the year. And look what I brought you. Mushrooms, darling, a whole basket full of them, all gathered within the last hour. And they should be cooked and eaten within the next. Oh, not again. Let me see. Darling, those are not mushrooms. They're toadstools. You're supposed to be an expert in these matters. I am an expert, and this is a particularly delicious species of mushroom. It's absolutely delicious, and it's called honey agaric. Well, don't sound so hurt about it. All right, I accept it. They're edible, even if they don't look it. And if it'll make you happy, we'll have them for dinner tomorrow. Oh, no, no. Tonight. The honey agarics lose their flavor in just a few hours, and 
Really, they must be eaten very soon after they're picked. Now, if the stove's really hot, I'll cook them for you now before the bloom is off them. Darling, it's Thursday. Thursday. And you know very well, every Thursday evening I play whist with the North Downs Ladies Club. And tonight it's Mrs. Wellington's turn to be hostess, and she lives all the way over in Haywards Heath. I'll be home very late, probably not till one or two in the morning. But your dinner's in the oven. I warmed up the leftovers for you. Thursday, yes, yes. I should have noticed you've done your hair. So put those disgusting toadstools down and come and start the car for me. Yes, darling. I'll be very, very late, George, so don't wait up for me. All right, darling. Let I drive carefully. I always drive carefully, George. You know that very well. Yes, Danny. And remember what I always have to tell you. Make sure the fire is not flaring up when you go to bed. Yes, darling. And don't forget to put the cat out. No, darling. Balkum, one nine two, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. One nine two. Hold the wire, please. Yes, thank you. Hello. Susan, my love, it's me. George, oh my love. Yes, it. It's Thursday again. I know, I know. I've been waiting for your call. Simply glued to the telephone. Well, can you come over? Of course I can. Oh my love. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll have much longer tonight. She's gone all the way to Haywards Heath. Oh, I love you so much, George. Five or six whole hours together. I, I can't wait to hold you in my arms again. We'll be alone, undisturbed, safe together. Just the two of us in the silence of the night. Oh, George, what a romantic man you are. Yes. Yeah, yes, oh, yes. Yes, as soon as you can, my love. I'll be waiting. I've already put the bed warmer in between the sheets. Oh, my love. I'm on my way. Good evening, Constable. Did I do something wrong? I'm sure I didn't. I'm a very good driver, even if I am a woman. Could I see your driving license, please, madam? My driving license? <laughs> Dear me, I don't have it. In fact, I don't even know where it might be. I haven't seen it for positively years. But I'm Mrs. George Havery from Balcombe Forest. Well, Mrs. Havery, you'd best turn around and go right back home again. And hope that you get there before your left-hand rear wheel falls off. You've got a terrible rear-hand wobble, Mrs. Avery. Oh, that. <laughs> I've had a rear-end wobble for quite some time now. My husband was going to get it fixed, but he's terribly forgetful. And I assure you, I've been driving around with a wheel like that for three months now, and nothing's ever happened, and the wheel's never fallen off. Well, if you're sure, Mrs. Avery, and you know you've only got one headlamp? Oh, no, not again. I thought it was all rather dim. Would you kindly thump it for me, Constable? Ah, ah, well, uh, there it is. Now, that should be all right now. Oh, yes, so much better. Thank you, Constable. Shall I uh, <clears throat> put another log on the fire? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I love to lie beside you and stare into the flames. I love you so dearly, George. Yes, I know it. And, and you know how much I love you. You know, the, the French have a way of putting it. Je t'aime à la folie. I, I, I love you to the point of, 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 of foolishness. Foolishness? No, George. It's not the right word. Mm, well, an old man and a young girl, yes, yes. Foolish is the only possible word. George, are you trying to tell me something? Yes. Did you... did you tell your wife about us? No. 
Oh, George, you promised me you would. You promised me we'd be married soon. And all I want out of life is, is to be with you for... Forever. Oh, George. Oh, now, there, there, there. Now, you, you mustn't cry, my love. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just... Oh, now, there, there. I, I decided that Bella would never give me a divorce, even if I were to tell her. And if we were to just uh, run off and live together, she, she'd harm us for the rest of her life. You know, that's the kind of woman she is. Then... It's it's all over between us. No. I'm going to get rid of Bella. Permanently. Oh, my God. Oh, George, you can't possibly mean what I think you mean. Well, if the idea occurs to you so readily, can you doubt that it occurred to me quite a long time ago? My only problem always was the means. Oh, George, they hang people for murder. Ah, you see, your first thought is for me, not for her. Oh, I like that. Oh. Well, then it came to me. Uh, she's going to eat a poisonous vegetable. And the coroner will say, death from natural causes. Vegetables are not, not poisonous. I eat them all the time. Well, you know, there's, there's wolf pain, which some people call monk's hood, and it looks like horseradish, but it's deadly poisonous. And castor seeds, just as bad. Daffodil bulbs, really potent. The leaves of tomatoes, well, they're nearly always fatal if ingested, but, you see, nearly always isn't certain enough. The little yellow seeds that potato plants sometimes throw will kill you very, very quickly, but, but it's painful, and uh, I, I don't want her to suffer. But there's one plant that's perfect. It's a kind of mushroom that looks somewhat like the ordinary field mushrooms that you buy at the greengrocers or collect in the woods. Its technical name is Amanita phalloides, called the death angel mushroom. Its poison is so strong that, uh, well, they handle an Amanita phalloides and then lick your fingers and you're very liable to drop dead on the spot instantly. And will you be able to find one of these... Uh, Amanitas? One of these Amanitas when you need it? Aha. Uh -huh. You see, that's exactly the crux of the whole matter. And what a bright young girl you are to hit on it. No. One could never be sure of finding one at just the right time. See, they, they spring up overnight. The rain comes and then phew, they're gone. But I was very, very clever. I found three of them a while back out in the forest under the oak trees, and I dug them up very carefully and transplanted them into pots and hid them in the cellar where conditions are absolutely ideal for, uh, for, for, for their long and healthy life. I collected some manure from the road, put a little in the bottom of each pot, and that will keep them snug and warm and well-fed against the time they needed. It, you've never seen my cellar, have you? No, I haven't. Uh, well, this cottage was built in the 15th century. They really knew how to build cellars in those days. It's arched in stone, and there's a, it's a feeling to it, a feeling of, you know, it's spooky, a good word. Hey, come, I'll show you. Why, it's, it's, mar it's marvelous. Yeah, mind the steps. They're, they're, they're very worn. Wait, let me light the lamp. There. Hold on to my arm. Can you see? Yes. Here, here. I had them behind the bench. No one but me ever comes down here, but still. Well, uh, uh, hold the lamp for me. I've got it. There. Three of them growing happily in the darkness and the silence. My darling. Oh, hold me tight. Oh, yes, tighter, tighter. Mm. Oh. No, my love. Oh, darling. My sweet. Oh. Uh. We all have respect for the dead. You'd think they'd have more respect for someone about to die, wouldn't you? But they don't, it seems. Three little pots of poison right beside them. That's really not very nice. Sears Radio Theater will return. Really quite beautiful. But they look look somehow lonely. I don't know how a mushroom can look lonely, but they do. 
angels of death. Do you see the spores on the top? The annulus on the stem? No, those are the signs that tell you, stay away, don't even touch. And once in a while, people still pick them and eat them, and, and, and well, they die. This is the fungus that gave the field mushroom its bad name. It's the fungus that's going to bring happiness to both of us forevermore. George and Bella Havery, a nice, average sort of couple, putting up with each other over the years because, well, it's not always easy to find a way out of that trap one can so easily fall into when one says those trite little words, I do. They're always said, have you ever noticed, with great enthusiasm, usually accompanied by a rather sickly sort of smile. But George is not the kind of man to let the weeds grow under his feet. Oh, no, indeed, he is not. Having decided on a certain course of action, he is losing no time at all in getting it done. And what we have now is your average couple in your average little country cottage settling down to your not-quite-average dinner. George, darling, you're not eating anything. No, I, I know, darling. My, my tummy is playing up dreadfully tonight. Oh, no. Well, then why don't you take a spoonful of baking soda and half a glass of water? No, I just did. Uh, all I, I'm going to have for dinner is a stalk or two of celery and perhaps some of the lettuce. Oh, but you really must have some of the mushrooms. They smell absolutely delicious, as they should indeed. I fried them in lots, simply lots of margarine with just a smidgen of lemon juice. You cooked my mushrooms in margarine? Well, of course. Butter's so terribly expensive these days. A ten-pound block of butter is 12 shillings now. And I simply will not sit still for that kind of highway robbery. That's exactly what I told the dairyman. And I always meant to ask you, are mushrooms fattening? Oh, no, no, absolutely not. Well, I don't really mind if they are anyway. I bought a new dress in the village this morning. The stripes run horizontally, and I honestly don't care anymore. No, I, I, I noticed that. I found a new kind of corset in the village, a great deal of whalebone in it, and it's really quite marvellous. It holds everything in place. Oh, but what a relief when I go to bed. And everything can just fall out again. Yes, <laughs> yes, I noticed that too. Uh, uh, what a delicious aroma there is to your mushrooms. What a shame I can't enjoy them tonight. Yes, isn't it? Oh, well, next time. Uh, there's one very special species there that I'm particularly proud of. Yes, and I never saw so many different varieties all at once. George, darling, you really have excelled yourself this time. Yes, well, it's, it's a mixture of morcellos and lepiotras and the marvellous Lactarius deliciosus and... Uh, and, and uh, uh, few others. You know, George, darling, I'm absolutely sure you won't mind in the least if I tell you. As a husband, you're no great shakes, mm. but as a gardener, there's no one to equal you. Oh, what a nice thing to say. The other night, Mrs. Wellington said, pottering around in the forest looking for wild plants to eat is the first sign of approaching senility. But I defended you, George. I just wouldn't listen to her. Yes, yes, of course. But uh, uh, the mushrooms, darling. Oh, yes, they smell marvellous. Yes, and they taste even better. There's one particular species there to the left of your plate, right beside the Brussels sprouts. It's the one with the pretty little spots on top and the annulus on the stem. That one has to be speared with your fork and popped into your mouth and eaten whole. You mean this one? That one. You know, <laughs> it looks rather Poisonous. Oh, How can anything look poisonous? Hmm? What's it called? It, uh, co well, it's, a, um, no, it's called a, a Boynton Wonder. And I have to pop it into my mouth whole? Yes. Like this? Yes. Exactly mm -hmm. like that. Mm. Oh, mm, darling, that is absolutely one of them. Mm. Mmm, one of the most delicious, de <gasps> Well, what an unconscionably long time that took. Number, please. A uh, Bolcom, one nine two, please. Thank you. Was that one nine 
Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, one nine two. Thank you. Uh, thank you. One nine two. Hold the wire, please. Thank you. Hello. Susan Muller, don't come near me for the next few days. I'll call you when it's safe. <gasps> George, you didn't. Yes, but I did, my love. Wait, just a few days. Let's be wise now. It all went splendidly. Operator, operator, uh, uh, please, uh, you, uh, please uh, get me the, the county hospital. It's an emergency. Could have been her heart, of course. If you'll forgive me, Mr. Havery, people who carry so much, um, uh, what a poor around with them. Medical science is now beginning to postulate that overweight has a very definite influence on the heart. <laughs> and it's really quite possible, ridiculous though it may seem. Did you have a history of heart trouble? Uh, oh, no, no, Dr. Dr. Wilson, no. In fact, she was examined only two or three years ago when the life insurance came up for renewal. No, no, they said her heart was very strong. Mm. Then perhaps something she ate. How could that be? I mean, well, we, we were eating a very simple country dinner. It was uh, boiled beef with Brussels sprouts, potatoes, mushrooms, and uh, an ordinary garden salad. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. I have it. Did you perhaps have horseradish in your salad? Horseradish? Had a case 12 years ago. <laughs> Dear old lady who lived at Morapo Chestnut Avenue, just down the lane from here. She picked some wild horseradish for her salad, only it wasn't horseradish at all. It was wolfbane. They look almost exactly alike, only wolfbane is deadly poisonous. Oh, poor thing, she was still in the prime of life, only 80 years old and fit to the fiddle. No, n n no horseradish, sir. You see, poor, poor dear Bella, he, he never liked horseradish. You, uh, you do realize, do you not, uh, there'll have to be an autopsy, I'm afraid. Yes, yes, I, I suppose so. It means we have to carve her up. Essential, don't you know, that we find out just what it was she died of? Yes, yes, of course. Oh, dear Lord. Well, it's not a nice thought, I will admit. But we console ourselves with the thought, the very essential thought, they don't feel it, you know. No, I don't suppose they do. Um, uh, 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 doctor, uh, would I be informed, do you think, of the result of the autopsy? I mean, could I perhaps uh, um, get a copy of the coroner's report? Oh, the simplest thing in the world, my dear Mr. Havery. I'm quite sure you'll be the first to know. But in any case, it will be filed away with the clerk of the court, and it's available to anyone who wants to see it. Anyone at all. <laughs> Morning, dear young lady. Good morning, sir. Ah, you must be the clerk of the court, am I correct? How nice it is to see ladies filling these oh so important posts nowadays. Ah, uh, no, sir. I'm I'm secretary to the clerk of the court. Can I help you? Oh. Oh, then perhaps I should see the clerk himself. Well, I'm afraid he's having his tea now, sir. But if I could be of any assistance. Oh. Well, perhaps you can. Uh, there, there was an inquest this morning on a certain Mrs. George Havery. Mrs. George Avery? Oh, yes. Uh, I wonder if you would be good enough to tell me what the verdict was. Well, I think it was... Uh, now, now, let me see. Ah, yes. A verdict of accidental death. Yes, accidental death. It seemed that she gathered some mushrooms in the woods and ate them, and they were poisonous. Oh, how sad. Oh, yes, it is indeed, Mr... Uh, 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 Tobias. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Tobias? My name is Miss Woods, Nadine Woods. My home is really in London, but I have digs down the road here, just to bed sit with Mrs. Fruit. From London? I'm from London, too. Oh, really? <laughs> well, all the nicest people come from London, <laughs> don't they? They do indeed. Um, 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 and the verdict on Mrs. Bella Havery, uh, it is, I presume, what one might call final? Oh, yes, of course. Accidental death. Uh, excuse me. The Honourable Justice wants it typed up immediately, Nadine. And he's in a terrible mood today. 
You better get it finished off an hour ago. Oh, he's always in a terrible mood. Well, uh, you've been most kind, uh, my dear young lady. I, I, I thank you, and I, I bid you good afternoon. Who's the old codger? Oh, what a nice old man. His name's Mr. Tobias. Vincent Price again, and here's the concluding act of Mushrooms, Darling. What a nice old man. His name is Mr. Tobias. Mr. Tobias, a nice old man? Well, I'll say this for him. Once an idea came to Mr. Tobias, he followed it all the way down the garden path. That night, he broke into George's cottage, stealthily, quietly, and really quite skillfully. Though I'm sure that wasn't a very nice thing to do. <gasps> George, George, <laughs> wake up. <laughs> oh, oh, Susan, my love. Oh, George, we have a burglar. What? A burglar. I distinctly heard a noise downstairs. Oh, no. Oh, yes. No, my love, we don't have burglars in Balkan, only in places like London. But I heard something, a plate or something mm. fall. No, the cat. The cat? Yeah. Poor old cabby. She's really past her prime and getting to be quite short-sighted, you know. Always knocking plates off the dresser. What on earth would she be doing up on the dresser? Oh, she likes to sleep there, my precious. Right beside the bread bin. You know, her smell of the bread is a great comfort to her. Oh. Now go back to sleep, my love. No burglars, I assure you. Why in heaven's name? Who'd want to break into a peaceful little cottage like this? In Balkan? Oh, sweetheart, no. It's just not done. It was only one day after the inquest, an inquest that had been really most satisfying. And yet George's perfect crime was beginning to show lamentable signs of coming apart at the seams. <laughs> Delightful, just delightful. Oh, my love, I'm so happy. A uh, whole new future ahead of us. Oh, it's so cold tonight. Hmm. Well, well, oh, poor old cabby, did you miss me then? Oh. Well, you see, the house is quite warm after all. Give me your coat, my love. Well, who lit the fire, I wonder? Good heavens. <gasps> Good evening, Mr. Havery. I lit the fire. It really was quite cold in here. I didn't know how long I might have to wait. Would you mind telling me, sir, what the devil you are doing in my house? I don't think I like the idea of strangers just barging in uninvited and making themselves at home. Uh, my name is Tobias, and I'm not a stranger, sir, but a neighbor. A, a neighbor? Yes, I live in the little cottage on the top of the knoll, the one with the green shutters that overlooks both the edge of the forest and your own abode, Mr. Havery. And your purpose in coming here so, uh, so unexpectedly? To offer you my condolences on the death of your wife. What else? George... I'm suddenly frightened. Uh, quite without reason. Uh, death is so much a part of my own life that I thought it would be only courteous of me to call and pay my respects. Oh, well, uh, uh, it's kind of you, I'm sure. I, uh, I thank you and uh, bid you good night. Why don't you sit down, both of you, and make yourselves comfortable? We have so much to talk about. No, this is my house, Mr. Tobias. I will sit down when I choose to do so and not before... Would you mind telling me how you got in here? I'm quite sure both doors were locked. Indeed they were. But I found a window open, as I did last night. <gasps> George, the burglar. Oh, my dear young lady, not a burglar. Burglar steal. I'm not a thief. I was merely browsing. I think the time has come, Mr. Tobias, for me to insist that you leave this house at once. You're not welcome here. No. I didn't really think I would be a shame, such a shame, particularly since we have so much in common. I find it hard, sir, to think of anything we might have in common. But two things. One, an interest. The other, uh, what shall I call it? Uh, yes, yes, an obsession. That's the word, exactly. I also find it hard, sir, to put up with you any longer. Uh, the interest we share is in the study of 
fungi or of, 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 of mushrooms, shall we say. Oh, of course, my knowledge of the subject is not nearly as comprehensive as your own, though I can distinguish quite easily between a field mushroom and, say, an Amanita phalloides. I quite fail to see the purpose of your chatter, and frankly, it doesn't interest me. Good night, Mr. Tobias. It was Amanita poisoning your wife died of. That was established at the coroner's inquest. An accident. But you picked the wrong mushrooms. Mm, from your cellar, perhaps. That's where I was browsing last night. I found three pots of Amanita there being carefully nurtured with, may I say, commendable expertise. Uh, and I know how they got there. I watched you through my spyglass, uh, digging them up from under the oak trees where the forest begins. And I thought to myself, good heavens, that's George Havery. He must know how deadly they are. He, he's a long-established expert in this field. He wouldn't make a terrible mistake like that. And I began to wonder about it. And then your wife died... Uh, accidentally, and your very young and beautiful mistress hurries to your bed only hours after the corpse is disposed of. It's all beginning to add up, isn't it? And, and, and has it ever occurred to you, it so often happens that the police can't solve a murder simply because they don't have the necessary evidence, and that, in turn, is because it so often happens that nobody bothers to tell them where they might find it. George, we have to buy him off. No, let me handle this. All right, Mr. Tobias. You don't exactly look like a policeman. How kind of you to say so. But if you are one, then make your charges in the proper quarter, and when the time comes, I will dispose of them. <laughs> and by the time that time comes, you will also have found the time to dispose of the evidence down there. No, no, I'm afraid I cannot permit that, Mr. Havery. Well, we'll see about that. Uh, stop. Not another step, Mr. Avery. A gun? In my house? A revolver is a very necessary adjunct to my profession. I'm quite expert with it, I assure you, and I'm quite prepared to use it. Oh, not to kill you, of course. <laughs> Under the circumstances, that would be a very foolish thing to do. Now, just to incapacitate you. So close the door and sit down. As you so quickly guessed, I am not a policeman. Then I don't understand what it might be that you can possibly want. Well, we can't have you grouping about in obfuscation, can we? Will you answer me a question? Perhaps. Why did you not destroy that terribly incriminating evidence down in your cellar the moment it had served its purpose? It's a question that's worried me for a long time. No comment, and you can quote me. You left those Amanitas down in the cellar, growing so handily and so well, because it occurred to you that you might want to use them again. No, oh, what arrant nonsense. No, no, no. Hear me out. I beg of you. The obsession. Now, let us discuss what might be called the, the assumption of the ultimate majesty, the, the taking of life for its own sake. Oh, there's a tremendous feeling of triumph, is there not? An almost narcotic sense of gratification. I, I felt it myself after I killed my first victim. And, and it stays with you, you know. It really does. Seeking more and still more fuel for the fire of the most stimulating sensation in the whole gamut of man's emotions. Oh, he's mad. You can set fire to a man's house. You can hit him over the head and steal his pocketbook. You can seduce his wife away from him. You can ruin him in the stock market. And all these things are picayune, inconsequential trivia. But to take his very life, ah, that's a different kettle of fish. It brings with it an almost godlike sense of power. And we all want to be gods, do we not? Mr. Tobias, you said after you killed your... Your first victim? Oh, yes. Yes, my first. Oh, that was a long, long time ago. I, I've killed a total of... Let me see. Well, I've killed 11 people. And each time, that ultimate majesty gets stronger and stronger. It's become... Yeah, yeah, an obsession is the only word. But the supply of victims these days seems to be drying up. It's, it's very frustrating. 
<laughs> May I use your phone? Yes, uh, please don't move, Mr. Havery. Sit just where you are. Remember my revolver. Number, please. Oh, would you be kind enough to get me the police station? I believe the number is Balcom 326. Thank you. 326. Hold the wire, please. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, police station. Sergeant Brown speaking. Ah, uh, Sergeant Brown. This is Mr. Tobias. I'm calling from Mr. George Havery's house on Elderberry Lane. Would you send a constable over, please? There's been a murder. Why, Mr. Tobias? In God's name, why? <laughs> I'm the hangman, Mr. Havery. I fastened that knotted hempen rope around your neck. I throw the lever that opens the trap door. And I've found myself another victim, haven't I? <laughs> Isn't that nice? Mushrooms, Darling, was written by Alan Caillou. Produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our star was Ben Wright. Also heard were Betty Harford, Ivor Barry, Diana Chesney, Valerie Cooney, Richard Peel, Marvin Miller. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.